One of the biggest questions that frequently comes up for artists, especially when they're beginning as students, but also when they're quite well into their artistic journey, is the idea of drawing fun things, things that you enjoy versus drawing and working on your fundamentals, grinding away, let's say, and improving your perspective or rendering, working on your anatomy. This idea of fun versus fundamentals, I think, is a really key thing to get right in your mind. And that's what we're going to talk about in this episode. I've seen a lot of people embrace the grind and obviously understand that they need to smash the fundamentals, really learn all of these foundational principles and do it early because that's what's going to allow them to get to the top level to become professional artists. I've also seen those same people burn out and fail and lose their way after three, four, five years of grinding and burning out and working on the fundamentals. It's easy to lose your direction, your style. They often feel like, look, they're good at this one thing, but they've sort of lost touch with why they wanted to be an artist in the first place. And they don't really enjoy it in the same way that they did when they were just, you know, sketching around in their sketchbook and having fun. But I've also seen a lot of students and people who haven't embraced the fact that this is a craft and we need to get better at the technical aspects of the art that we want to make. And they too, even though they might enjoy drawing, never really, you know, get to the next level. They never really get their perspective sorted. Their drawings don't often you know, bring out all of the imagination that they had. And they're often not able to actually complete and actualize all of the ideas and visions that they have inside. So that is all to say that I think the answer here is going to be a nuanced one. It's very much a matter of threading the needle. And hopefully through unpacking some of these ideas of how we learn, how we apply and what some of the traps can be, Hopefully I'll be able to help you find your way through this path so that you too can thread the needle and make sure that you're having fun on your artistic journey. All right, welcome to the Visual Scholar Podcast. My name's Tim McBurney. I've been a professional working artist for over 20 years. And on this show, we're all about demystifying the world of art creativity and productivity so that you can get better faster and enjoy your artistic journey. Now, there's a number of things that I think go into this idea. The first is just thinking about what is actually happening when we are learning to draw and what modality of learning are we into? Because I think that often what happens is we get a lot of the traditional learning modalities like, uh, you know, we sort of get in school where it's more about pass, fail, learning modalities. You learn a bunch of information and then you kind of get tested on it. And it's like, do you, is that right or wrong? So I think that that's a little bit different to how the learning modality of drawing works. And I think that's the first part that we really need to unpack. The second thing that I think really goes into this whole idea of fun versus fundamentals and grinding away and doing things that are uncomfortable is that as I've spoken about on previous episodes, there's only a small amount of time where I think each day you can actually really grind away and take in new information. I think that's a small amount anyway. And also one of the things I've noticed is that it's so important to integrate these ideas that you're learning into your actual everyday craft and practice. And I think there's a lot of dangers that I've seen where people will get really good at a lot of fundamental things. They're doing what they should do. However, they, they're they not really able to apply it to the kind of art that they wanted to do in the first place. And connecting those dots can be very tricky unless you do it gradually. And this is really just a matter of integration and how we integrate the foundation into the type of art that we want to create. Because we all have styles and unique individual traits that we're interested in for our art. Our art has functional purpose to a certain degree. We're often trying to do a particular thing with it to get a particular emotion from an audience. And the insofar as our foundation helps with that, 
it's good, but you need to be able to bridge those two worlds, so to speak. And I think the integration is really key. Now, the last thing that I think what I really want to talk about is what that sort of integration situation looks like, right? So how do we kind of take some of these ideas and actually form it into maybe like an idealized way of working or, or one that certainly I've found works for me and, and works for a lot of people. Um, but, uh, you know, just how can you go about thinking about integrating some of these ideas that we're going to talk about into, you know, your sort of active uh, day, right? How do you actually apply that? So those are the three things I really want to sort of discuss and we'll have a few takeaways right at the end. But again, first up is just this idea of learning modality. So modality really is just a fancy way of saying kind of a, a like a way of doing something. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a frame. It's a sort of an entire system or a way of thinking about a particular thing. It's a mode of thought or a mode of behavior. And again, this is very much my way of framing this. And what I would say is that from my experience, and again, based on the things that you can kind of read and divine about drawing, is that it is very much a physical learning modality and that it has much more in common with sports martial art or dance or anything where we're needing to integrate very thoroughly the sort of information that we're getting and our actual ability to do it so that the act is performed via our body and what we're trying to do is train that body to do better now i've talked about this again in previous episodes where we consider the role of the conscious versus subconscious mind which again is just a really fancy way of saying that there's things that you do automatically, subconsciously, and much of, you know, shooting a basketball or, you know, hitting something with a tennis racket or doing a particular dance move is something that often really is happening subconsciously. You're not thinking about all of the different moves that you do. These are not happening in conscious thought. These are things where often the only conscious thought is one of hit the ball or win. <laughs> and you do all the other things later. So, I think drawing is very much the same as this. What we are trying to do is say, hey, I'm drawing a face and I want that face to be happy or sad or more sad or sad in a slightly more remorseful way. And that's the input we have and our mind and our body kind of naturally do the right things. And there's kind of this mystery box in the middle that kind of handles the input, which is a conscious thing. And then the output, which is you drawing lines on the face to try and get that feeling. So just think about how complicated and abstract that is. If you actually wanted to track down all of the things that you're doing to make a face more sad or more poignant or, you know, happy and sad, it would be very difficult. And it's not something where you're necessarily thinking about these things all the time. Now, to learn how to do that, you might have studied a lot of people, you might have broken down expressions, and you might kind of know all the, you know, the tension of the face needs to be a particular way, the shape of the mouth needs to be a particular way. But when you're actually applying it, and you're doing this at a high level, once you've sort of learned it, there's not a lot of that information floating around, you're just thinking about like the result you want, and your body is kind of trying to get that result. Similar to, again, if you're a professional tennis player or you just have a good game. Um, again, I don't play a lot of tennis, but I imagine it's more a matter of thinking about where you want the ball to go. What you actually do is look at the ball and then all of the other stuff just kind of has to happen, right? There's no time to kind of think, oh, okay, I need to move my feet here and move my feet there. What you're sort of thinking about is, you know, how much focus you can really bring to the task at hand. The more you can focus on the right things, the more that, again, you can watch the ball, stay focused on that, the more that you can focus on, again, controlling your breathing, right? Making sure that you're not out of energy. There's these other higher level things that we, we can probably consciously control, um, but again, when it comes to actually thinking about the mechanics of hitting a ball, uh, you don't have time and that's not really how it works to think about, oh, okay, I need to you know, move my hand back and then hit the ball. You're mostly thinking about the output, uh, what you actually want to happen. And I think that's very 
similar for all of these physical based learning modalities. Now that's different to the way that often we're taught in a typical westernized school where it's a pass fail learning modality. And in that case, what's happening is we're sort of testing comprehension of a set of intellectual ideas in most cases. And what you see is when sports or, you know, dance or something like that is taught in these ways, they often have to have like theory that can be sort of jammed into a pass fail learning modality in order to actually assess it. Because that learning, again, your pass fail learning modality has no way of assessing whether or not someone has actually comprehended a thing or how they've comprehended it. Because what they want to know is why and do you actually know why you're hitting a ball a particular way? Do you know why you are drawing a face a particular way? Um, which is, is, is actually sort of irrelevant. So, you know, this is one of the problems you have with traditional learning, trying to teach a physical based skill is it's trying to find a way to assess it. And you kind of can't, right? Because we can kind of see the results and often the, the way the results are getting, uh, uh, are achieved is um, through that kind of mystery box, right? Of the subconscious mind. So it, it doesn't fit. And it's not just that where potentially we've been taught to think about art and school in this way. Um, it's that we're often trained in a pass fail learning modality. And if you're an artist, you're often maybe not that into a pass fail theoretical learning modality. Uh, we tend to be more lateral thinkers, more intuitive, um, again, with broad strokes. So, you know, from my experience, certainly, and, and what I see from a lot of students uh, is that, you know, we didn't really like the pass fail learning modality. And there's a lot of trauma associated with it. And the trauma occurs when it comes to the point where you have to sort of either pass or fail. So you're given a chunk of information and your job is to look at the information, comprehend the information, and then prove that you have comprehended it. And that only happens in this written verbal pass fail modality. So the way that we prove it is by writing it or verbalizing it. Now, this is a problem because a lot of those artistic or physical based learning skills happen in a nonverbal part of the brain, right? Where A, you, you know, we're probably in flow while we're doing that. And we'll talk a little bit more about sort of being in flow uh, later and how important that is. But you're, you're also, you know, in this flow or this, you know, right brain nonverbal state when you're doing it, right? You, you kind of can't explain what's going on because there's often not time to explain. And a, a big part of the reason this, I, I would sort of suppose this is, is because, Again, the verbal comprehension part of the brain is like something that developed a lot later and it's a lot slower uh, as, as a way of learning and comprehending. <clears throat> it's also important to understand that throughout the history of the human species, right, um, these like highly advanced hominids, is that reading and writing is very new. So... A million years ago, there was probably some form of visual learning occurring where maybe you can see someone doing something. Uh, the classic example I often give is of, you know, you're watching a David Attenborough documentary, a nature documentary, and you can see there's one of these monkeys trying to crack a nut. And we kind of look at this monkey and we think they're very advanced because they're using a tool and the tool is a giant rock. So there's a little monkey and he's learning because it's a baby monkey learning to, you know, smash a rock on a nut to crack the rock, to crack the nut, sorry, to get, you know, the, the nice bit inside that they can eat. And there's a practice, there's a way of doing this where the monkey is probably going to try it a bunch. They're going to look at another monkey doing it. And it's the skill that's passed down. So that's been happening for a long time, this idea of observing skills, looking at mirror neurons that are a good functional sort of way of doing that, of looking at a physical skill, being able to sort of ingest the information visually, non-verbally, and then actually magically kind of be able to repeat that skill. So this is a really, really important point to make. And I think, uh, again, a, a big part of this sort of episode in general is just respecting the fact that from a learning modality standpoint, 
we're much closer to that monkey than we are to uh, your sort of Aristotle, uh, your, uh, um, again, you know, your sort of modern human that is uh, trying to write, read and write. And I often point this out that it's not just that, but if you think about there being a, a history of people writing and reading things, sure, that goes back maybe 6,000 years, 10,000 years, uh, people reading and writing, but it's a very small percentage of people who are actually capable of doing that. And you can tell that because, you know, a lot of us might actually have or, or know someone who has a living relative who was illiterate. Uh, there's a lot of people who, you know, are still alive who don't read or write uh, because it just wasn't an important part of their life at that time. And if you go back a hundred years, even, um, you know, there's a, there's probably maybe a majority of people who can't read and write. So this idea that we're going to sort of jam all of this information through this learning modality that is pretty new, like absurdly new is, is super interesting. And, uh, I think the reason that it is not that effective at a lot of skill acquisition is just down to evolutionary biology, right? It's just, we just don't have the advanced skills to acquire knowledge in that way. And it's something we really have to learn and think about. So there's nothing wrong with that learning modality. It's been very good for doing a whole bunch of stuff. But um, when it comes to learning these things that are actually learned in, again, sort of a, a visual, um, physical um, learning modality, then um, again, it's just important to appreciate how and why that happens. Now, it's useful to think about these things. And certainly, again, you can tell I'm probably burdened by a lot, by too much intellectual <laughs> um, knowledge acquisition because um, I'm trying to explain these things when really the answer is just to sort of do it. This is interesting, obviously. It's an interesting conversation. The real problem I think often occurs, as I said, is that there is often trauma associated with a pass-fail written verbal learning modality. If you've been to one of these schools and you have an exam or a test, and I think what tends to happen is that we develop a very strong editing mindset. And that's where we are kind of stopping ourselves going into flow because we're wanting to check that we're doing things right. So instead of being more intuitive, what we're trying to kind of say is like, no, let's check all these facts. So what what typically occurs is you, you go into a test or you're writing an essay and you're thinking about it and you kind of have a lot of these editing mindsets where you think about like, oh, is this going to happen or is that going to happen? Um, is this going to be right? Am I going to be wrong? Am I going to be, um, you know, embarrassed, right? Is something bad going to happen here? Uh, and, you know, I think not only that, but if we, if we fail, what typically occurs after we fail is that we have to go back. It's like, oh, you have failed to properly comprehend the knowledge. You step back from that. And then what you do is you begin to get more information so that you can attack this problem again from a slightly different perspective. And it's this thing where we're sort of trained to step back and, you know, acquire new knowledge as opposed to just try again slightly differently, try again slightly differently. That is the type of learning modality that you're going to see with something like sports. So if you compare, again, the idea of getting tested on math, right, you try to do the math, you fail. The answer is you step back, you learn again, you have another go. But with the basketball, if you're trying to learn to shoot hoops, you shoot the basketball and, you know, often the way we learn is we just try again. We try slightly differently and the failure is less important. So in a physical learning modality, failure is actually a huge part of the process. It's not a big deal. And a huge way that we obviously learn is just by practicing, by trying again and again and again and again and again, and not getting caught up quite so much with the idea of failure. I think this idea is critical and hopefully I've made it well enough so that at least we're appreciating the differences between ways that we can learn and the way that we might have learned to learn. The reason that this is so important is that often 
these ideas can get in the way of fun. And a lot of what we're doing when we're actually practicing drawing, and we need to do this in order to you know, learn to draw as well, is we're in a state of flow. We are engaging very much with that subconscious mind, the non-verbal mind, the non-verbal, non-linear to a certain degree, more lateral way of thinking, where we're much more likely to think about the connection between, uh, of, you know, different ideas, different things. And the concept of just mashing ideas together and seeing what happens and letting it not just flow in terms of being, you know, in flow, but letting the ideas flow, letting you mind, letting your mind wander. This is integral to being an artist, to think laterally, to think creatively. Often people have to give this a label when they're just going about their day in office buildings, we often describe this as a brainstorming session. And a brainstorming session is essentially where everyone agrees not to criticize each other so that hopefully we can all as a group get into a modality of creativity or positivity of collaboration where ideas aren't going to be shot down. And because ideas aren't going to be shot down, there aren't any bad ideas there's no way to fail. There's no way to be embarrassed. And so you can start to engage this more creative mindset where you think, oh, hey, how about X, Y, Z? How about if we take this idea and this idea and just mash them together? What would happen there? Let's think about that. Now, this idea of just more free association is antithetical. It's in opposition to a pass, fail, written verbal learning modality. Because in those instances, what you're trying to do is desperately find the right answer, not the wrong answer, and basically no to, to not worry and rid your mind of any creativity whereby you might accidentally mash two ideas together that aren't right. We're after a linear way of considering the problem. And in most cases, these situations where we're doing essays and tests and things when we're younger in school the answer is actually known ahead of time and everyone kind of knows that the answer is known and we all just kind of have to agree on it and get to it and prove that we know how to get there. This is just not how the creative process works. There is no right answer. There is no end output that is predefined. We're making it up as we go and there are no rules. You can do it any way you want. You can use a variety of medium. There's not necessarily any prescribed procedure that you have to follow. It's creative in nature and getting in touch with that and understanding that that is the space that you will be occupying in most cases if you are drawing or creating art and that as we exit it and go into an editing or maybe a more of a design mindset where we're considering a brief or some type of outcome that has a defined goal, that we need to do that consciously because one of the major things that you will learn about creativity and people who spend their days in a creative flow and a creative practice is that they put a big focus on separating the editing mindset, which is that critical, you know, is this good or bad idea from just coming up with stuff. And writers will often talk about this idea where you need to write without thinking about the editing process, about whether or not you're considering, is this writing good? Is it bad? You just let it flow and just type. And that that's often where the creativity creativity comes from. That's where the magic and the art comes from is just by doing it and free associating and letting the characters speak for themselves. Not necessarily by having some rigid idea for what your character will do, what your character will say, and then having a linear progression of you making that happen as you write it, that these things kind of spring from idea space. They spring from the subconscious mind and your characters ideally should start writing themselves. This again is speaking to this idea of the action, the thing that you actually do stemming from this kind of magical box in the middle that we can label as a subconscious mind or have some way of rationalizing, but really a lot of the why these things happen is unknown. To layer on top of that is another really important point here. 
And that is that if we look at the brain waves that typically occur when someone is in flow, when they are when they when they are in this state of free association, that they're not in the verbal sort of thinking tense mindset, right? They are in this kind of brainwave session that, that is really just between sort of consciousness and unconsciousness. So if we look at the brainwave states of you being highly alert, highly, you know, a little bit more anxious for good reason, looking for threats, looking for what is going to happen for causality, doing the thinking, the processing. And then we sort of take that as a spectrum towards the point where you're asleep, right? Where there's no conscious worrying about threats or anything like that happening. There's obviously degrees of relaxation and alertness. And flow is a situation where we're actually kind of dipping down to a point where from a brainwave perspective, we're kind of just above consciousness. So we're conscious, but our brain waves aren't at a frequency that we uh, associating with a high level of alertness or um, sort of be of, of awareness, right? And again, this is tricky. These these ideas are it, it, it's counterintuitive because when we're in flow, we are highly alert, but we're not doing it in that kind of mental way. And often, what happens is you know people who are climbing mountains or doing tricks or doing very dangerous things are often needing to be in a state of flow. People who are fighting or doing a, a dance performance need to kind of not be able to assess the risk of them failing in that task. Because if you look down at yourself pedaling the bike, you often start to think about it and then you fall over. So we're often trying to get into a state of flow and the state of flow is the sort of very far away from being anxious and in that editing intellectual mindset. So if you're stressed, right, this is the TLDR of this, is that if you are stressed, it's hard to go into flow. So if you have trauma from a pass fail learning modality and you're sort of getting these things mixed up where fun right where you're just enjoying and flowing from a drawing perspective and that kind of gets too mixed up with the idea of oh is this drawing right or wrong how do i learn this um you know should i should i focus just on sort of information gathering and knowledge um you know i'm not drawing well does that mean i should go and learn more these things are often going to really sort of jam up the way that you would sort of want to be learning, which is you sort of turn those ideas off and you just kind of start practicing. You, you go into flow. So again, that's, that's a very sort of, there's a lot of information there. Um, but the key is that we want to be having fun and enjoying the process because that is where we're going to be going into flow and that's where things are going to work. So if you're trying to draw well and then you're stressed and you're worrying about it, it makes it harder to go into flow, harder to free associate. And what that often means is you don't draw as well as you potentially could. There's no magic happening. You can mechanistically do things, but we're not operating in our optimum level. So it's the idea of that traditional way that you might have been taught to learn is sort of antithetical to the way that we need to learn when we're drawing the way that we need to practice when we're drawing, if that makes sense. And I think this is a really important point to grasp because what it says to me is that you need to be having fun. You need to be enjoying the process. Otherwise, if you're not, if you're stressed, if you're worried, if you're engaging in a written pass fail sort of ideology of, is this right? Is this going, am I doing this correctly? Um, if you're stressed, if you're not enjoying it, uh, if you're frustrated, you're not really going to learn that well. You need to be in a good state of mind with drawing so that you're practicing going into flow, being in a good creative mindset, having positivity about it. And what you tend to find is, from my experience anyway, is that the more we do that, the better the drawings get. And not just that, but at a high level, what we want to develop and learn is a sense of sort of positive free association 
um, lateral thinking, collaborative, yes and thinking. And that's what we sort of want to focus on and, and, and spend most of our time doing as artists, as opposed to more of a uh, engineering, uh, mathematical sort of right and wrong ideology or thought space. Because again, it's important to understand we're not building a bridge. The, the goal is not necessarily known. It's not necessarily critical. We're not going to kill a whole bunch of people if we get the math wrong on the bridge. And, you know, that's just super important to understand that, you know, you're, you're not doing one of these sort of engineering tasks. We're doing a creative task. And that's kind of the mindset you want to approach it with. And that really is the the thing that we need to work towards. And it's not necessarily possible to work towards it with, you know, this idea of accruing knowledge, right? And, and you know, just getting better and better on the intellectual side. You actually have to apply it. And applying it is, I think, a big part of the next idea here, which is that integrating the knowledge when you're learning to draw is just as important as learning the knowledge. One of the most obvious strategies that we can employ when we're learning to draw is to lean into the obvious benefit of focusing on fundamentals and getting really good at it. If we focus on all of our foundational principles, such as perspective, rendering, our anatomy, etc., it's logical to think that if we just learn all of these things and we get all this information, that this will mean that, okay, I've got that out of the way. Now I can go do what I want. And this is what is stated as the goal of learning a foundation. And a lot of very, very highly decorated schools will take this sort of approach to a certain degree where a big part of the education is abstract study, where you're learning to do perspective and rendering on geometric forms and things that aren't really what you would draw in the end. They're these uh, simplified objects. And I think this is actually a really valuable way of learning, but it is easy for people to, I think, take this path a little too seriously and put too much effort into it. And I've seen this happen where people get this idea and you're told to study your foundation to get really good at these things. And so they do it and they just do that and they crush it and they grind through it and they kind of do all the things that you're meant to do, but they forget to create art and they forget to integrate these ideas into their work. And often the result of that is that they get good at the abstract exercise, like render, um, a, you know, a cube, um, render complex geoform, figure out how to do accurate shadow casting, figure out how to draw anatomy. So the figure with all the muscles everywhere, the flayed man, right? The écorché model, um, you know, and create these kind of static figures or even to create posed figures. But that often what happens is that people can render well but rendering the things they want to render well. So you want to render a car well. Again, you get good at rendering cubes and it's harder to translate those things. Or again, you do translate that skill from rendering a cube to rendering a car. But because the, you've been rendering static things so often, it's difficult to get style in there. And it can also be tricky to learn how to bend those rules when you need. You get so used to following these linear rules that your creativity gets a little bit stifled. And that can be tricky because often what you're trying to do is less about perfecting some technical level. It's more a matter of perfecting and getting good at communicating your message to someone who's looking at your art. So you might want to twist the body of the car a little bit. You might want to draw it so that it feels like it's going fast. You might want to not really draw half of it at all because that's what will help the overall image. And people kind of find it really tricky to make that leap. And so everything just becomes about rendering for no reason other than to render because that's what you know is going to get you the, the tick the the pass and it's going to avoid someone saying that's not rendered properly that's not drawn properly 
Similarly, if people come to draw anatomy and you get really good at drawing life drawing um, or you get really good at just sort of rendering, again, all of the muscles on the figure, often what happens is people then have real hardship when it comes to drawing people themselves because they're so used to drawing anatomy and the goal is not to draw anatomy. The goal is to draw people and it might be to draw people in an, in an exaggerated way. And it can be important to not draw half of the muscles because you don't actually see them or because that's not important. And so this is where, again, it's sort of the tail starts to wag the dog to a certain degree with these ideas. And I've seen this happen a lot where people will, again, do the right thing. They'll sort of do what they're being told to do, studying all of the fundamentals and, you know, not focusing on their own sort of style quite so much. And it just happens too much. And three years in, they kind of lose their style. They, they forget why they were here. And, you know, it often can take years after that to reintegrate and figure out how to apply the things they've learned to the things that they actually want to do. So this is where I think the idea of focusing on integration throughout your artistic journey is really, really important. So we could say there's perhaps a few different levels to the idea of abstraction. If we consider our metaphor of shooting a basketball, for instance, because I think it's good to separate drawing from this to better understand it, there would maybe be a book written or a set of coaching ideas that are communicated verbally about how to shoot a basketball through a hoop. And this would be about where you place your feet, where you place your hips, your shoulders, how you hold the ball, the sequence. It might be about what you, where you visualize the ball going. It might be a matter of breathing exercises as you do it. It might be a matter of, again, bouncing the ball to kind of set your habitual rhythm. There's a whole bunch of ideas that people might give that are intellectual. Then there would be the actual practice of that, where you're maybe practicing different elements of it. So if one part of your game is off, you might hyper-focus on it and say, look, you really just need to focus on this one thing just where your feet are or just how you're holding the ball or what happens when you let go of the ball, all these micro skills. And you might focus on those and develop those in an abstract way. The actual task is about playing basketball where often there are pressures, there's noise, there's chaos. You might be running and then you have to stop, jump, shoot. And that's what you actually need to do. It doesn't really matter what the intellectual information is and how well you understand it. It also doesn't matter how good you are at doing the little studies or perfecting all the little bits and pieces of that skill. All that actually matters is can you do it? Can you actually perform the task? Can you get the ball in the hoop? Can you score a shot? That's what we're trying to do. And all of the rest is kind of periphery. Its only goal is to get us to that ultimate point where we're doing the thing that we're training to do. I think this is very similar to what happens when we're drawing and we're learning to draw. What we're often aiming to do is to be able to create a picture, an image, and that picture might have a person, a human, doing something. And we want that to feel like it's representing the real world. We want it to feel like it has the right perspective, the right sense of depth. We want to make sure that it feels like a person, like the anatomy is correct. There's nothing wobbly. Now, it doesn't really matter how well we can, you know, do a perspective exercise, whether or not we can draw, you know, a box or a cube perfectly. It doesn't matter whether we can cast shadows at 100%. It doesn't matter whether or not we understand all the properties of light and rendering, like core shadows, reflected light, ambient occlusion, how the Fresnel effect, um, you know, changes the way that surfaces look. It doesn't matter whether we know the Latin names for every muscle group. It doesn't matter whether we've done detailed ecorche models or detailed skeletal models. It doesn't matter how much life drawing we've done. 
It also doesn't matter how much our intellectual knowledge of these things is better or worse. You might have someone who is good at drawing life drawing, but maybe they don't know all the Latin names. It doesn't matter how good your verbal understanding of these concepts are. All that matters is can you do the drawing? Can you draw a person? Can you draw a human? Can you make them look right? Can you make it feel like there's dimension there? And I think it's really critical to understand the difference here. No one cares whether you know all the Latin names for muscles and all the anatomical markers. The only thing they care about is whether or not you can draw a person. This is very different to your traditional academic model where it's less about the output and more about your understanding and theoretical knowledge for how you got there. Often people are less interested in whether or not you get the math answer right they need to see your working out. They need to see your methodology. You need to prove it. From a scientific point of view, you need to have a hypothesis, something that's falsifiable. There's a process here. There's a situation where, you know, the, the intellectual side of it is maybe more important than the result because we need to have that thorough process. That is not what we're doing in art, however. The best way of framing this that I think we can have to sum up this idea of how important it is to integrate the knowledge and make sure that we're pushing everything towards the output that we want, performing the actual skill in the way that we want, giving the right emotion we want, performing in the way that we want, is that we want the least amount of mental, abstract, intellectual models that are separated from physical reality as possible. You want to make sure that as you learn an intellectual idea, that you apply it and make it meet reality, the reality of how you actually do it and how you specifically will do it and integrate it into your style. As an example, if we think about the abstract concept of perspective, this is where you need to learn how to represent the three-dimensional form on a two-dimensional page. Now, I would say the more that you understand the theory of it, if you read a book about perspective, yes, that's going to give you information, but in the same way that you could read a book about anatomy and that would give you information, the more I think that you build this intellectual version of how this is going to work, like, oh, I understand how the vanishing points work. Oh, I understand how this functions. Yes, I understand where the line of sight is, where my cone of vision is. I understand this muscle connects here. The more you build that stuff up in your mind without applying it in some way, the more friction happens when you actually do start to apply it. Because what we find with an intellectual mental model and the real world is that they're not going to overlay one-to-one because your actual experience of it is going to be specific to you. And the way that you're imagining it's going to happen is going to be different to the way you're actually going to do it. And if you just sort of apply things naturally, very easily, effectively, as you go, what you'll find is there's not much friction. You have an idea, you learn a new skill, you try it out, and you kind of figure out which bits of it you can apply, maybe which bits of it you didn't properly intellectually understand. You go back, you maybe refine that understanding, you go back, you apply it, and there's an interplay. And what we're doing in that case is focusing on the application of the skill and less on the intellectual side. The thing that we're trying to change is our application of it, us actually drawing perspective, drawing a house or something like that. And what you'll find is that it's a messy process. There's the idea that you might think you understand how it works until you apply it and then you realize, oh, actually this one thing in the intellectual model that I thought was not as important, right? You know, the exact angle that you need to calculate to get your cone of vision in perspective so you know that, you know, the, the sort of camera angle is actually correct. You might have thought that was, you know, 30 degrees or 60 degrees and, and actually that number is really important. If you mess it up, it's, you know, game over. The other thing is there might be a particular sequence. Oh, you put this line in before this line. If you do it that way, it's 10 times easier. And it's the application of these, this information to the way that you actually do it that kind of refines your understanding of the mental model, let's say. And it's that interplay that you need to work with. That is the actual learning. 
just having it in your head is not just useless. It can actually be counterproductive. And I've seen this a lot where people spend more time kind of thinking about what they're going to do than actually doing it. And this often happens when people think about the their magnum opus, right? This is the story that you're going to create or the art that you're going to create. And it's going to be this way and that way. And we haven't quite done it yet, but you know, it's uh, it's going to happen one day. One day we're going to create this thing and the grandeur and the scale and the impressiveness of all these works that we haven't completed grow and grow and grow. And they sort of grow to be, you know, unrealistic in their expectation. And that's one of the things that can really shoot us down is when we actually go to apply those things, we realize that maybe A, we can't get it to look that good and B, there's maybe a better way to do it that is different to the mental model. Once you actually understand what your skill set is, what you can and can't do, what you enjoy doing, all these things that you learn by actually doing and applying um, will change the ideas you have. They'll change the mental model. They'll change your expe your expectations, um, your aspirations, because you understand better what is possible with the art you're actually creating and how to learn stuff to improve that, how to think of things that are going to make more impressive images, etc. And I think this is an idea that works across all, the, all sort of aspects of art, is that the mental model and your idea you're better off getting that down on the page and into practice as soon as possible. Because I think that's when you get better integration between your imagination and the reality of putting it onto the page. The more separation there is there, the more fantasy, the rougher it is when you actually start to try and do it. And this is exactly the problem that I think frustrates people when they smash the fundamentals, they learn perspective rendering, they know all the names, they do all the stuff, they study their anatomy, you know, they understand the Latin names of all the, the muscles, they can do good life drawing. Then they go back to draw their manga comic and, you know, it's just not working because all that stuff doesn't necessarily apply to what they're doing and they don't now know how to sift through that information and figure out how to actually apply the different bits of it to the type of art that maybe they grew up wanting to do. And you might say, well, you know, they've sort of grown beyond that and their technical ability is, has grown beyond that. But so much of us creating art is about figuring out how to use the skills that we have to create an evocative piece of art. It's often about what we don't do. It's often about the muscles we don't put in, the way that we tweak perspective, the way that we add our own spin onto things, the way that we emphasize one thing over another that gives our art a unique feel and a unique flavor. And it's often these things that allow us to get more of our personality and our feeling and our emotion into the work. And that's often what makes the difference. So luckily enough, even though what I've been talking about is, to my mind, a bit of like, you know, word salad. It's a lot of intellectual information talking about theories of how we, you know, learn art. The reason that I go to such lengths to try and explain this and to try and unpack it is because I think the answer is actually really, really simple. I think as artists, we're going to learn very well and very naturally through learning in a natural way. That is where we learn by doing. Same with that monkey sitting there cracking the nut. We have an unbelievable amount of evolutionary development, of evolutionary sort of skill acquisition pathway where we can learn things by doing them and we can learn things by observing other people doing them and checking out ideas and just kind of playing around and messing around. That's kind of how we learn these physical skills. It's completely separate to the way that we're often trained to learn things in, you know, a book knowledge acquisition sense with reading and writing and tests. It's not normally how we're meant to learn things and that the answer is really simple. We just need to actually have fun while we're drawing. We need to practice and practice again and have a positive relationship to the idea of what you know, in a traditional environment would be called failure, which is where, again, it doesn't work and you need to tweak it. But often when we're creating art, the entire experience of creating the image is one of dealing with failure. We have a blank page. It needs improvement. It is a failure because it doesn't have our image on it yet. We improve it. 
And as we improve it, we make changes to it. And we're constantly seeing what changes we made to it are good and what are bad. What do we need to tweak? What do we need to fix? It's less about creating some perfect system for creating art where you have a perfect start to finish linear process. And it's more a matter of appreciating how to spot the happy accidents, how to hide the things that you don't want people to see, how to emphasize the areas of the picture that you do want them to look at, how to put your best foot forward, even when you might not have the technical ability, how to get your message across anyway. These are the things that we're doing as we create all day, every day. This is the thing that we do as artists. This is our bread and butter. Having a good relationship to this where it's not just that you don't see it as failure, it's that you don't really think about that at all. You just respond to the image and you're in flow and you're fixing things and trying to make it better and trying to improve it and trying to assess and that there's not really this sense of fear or editing or, oh, this is going badly. And maybe if there is, you have a very definitive process for how you step out of that creation process, look at it analytically, and maybe give yourself a couple of ideas or avenues that you might want to pursue before you step back into that creative process. This is what we do as artists, and it's important to appreciate this and not mistake book knowledge or intellectual knowledge for what we're actually doing. That is not to say that the information in the studies and the abstract nature by which we can acquire information isn't useful. This is similarly to, similarly to how you would have skills for getting better at shooting a basketball. There is sports science for drawing, and it is a lot of this foundational concept. Oh, you want to learn how to render better? Let's break it down. Let's understand what's happening. We have core shadows, reflected light, ambient occlusion. We have ambient light. We have all these concepts and properties of light. Let's break that down. Let's step back and let's study it from an abstract perspective. So you can really see what you are and are not understanding when you observe the world around you. This can help you to view the world and break it down and compartmentalize it in, you know, potentially a better way. And it can help you to solve problems. If you properly integrate this knowledge, again, of perspective, of the idea of a cone of vision, what's happening, how to fake perspective, when to know what you should or shouldn't fake perspective, if you're going to tweak it, which direction to tweak it in, when things are looking wrong, what are the things you should look for? Do you know where your light source is? All of these concepts, all these intellectual ideas are critical, but they need to be integrated and melded into our subconscious understanding of the world. And this is where, from a process standpoint, I think for me, but maybe not for you, um, I found that the best thing to do is to think about diving in and getting to a point where we feel like we need some extra intellectual knowledge. I think if you practice drawing people, for instance, you will come to a point where you're drawing people in your art and you realize that you don't know how to draw arms or you don't know how to draw hands or you don't know how to draw how an arm and a hand connect or you don't know how to draw a hand when it's holding something or when it's got one finger out. You don't understand how to correctly you know, exaggerate the proportions of a face. You don't know how to draw a young child. These are situations where now we have a void of information. This is what I would sort of colloquially term sponge theory. We have a sponge that is empty. And I think in these cases where you have a need for information that you're running up against a, like a brick wall where it's like, I keep trying this and it's not working. Intuitively, I understand that I'm missing something. And you go out with an empty sponge, right? You go out with a void of information that you're trying to fill. And I think in that case, when you go and find these abstract exercises, oh, this is how an arm works. Let me study how an arm works. I'm obviously not understanding it when I'm doing it, but let me do a page of studies just for a little bit of time. You're going to suck in that information. You're going to look at the Ecoche models. You're going to look at how the insertion points work, how it moves, right? How the arm moves as it changes. Um, its position in space. These are the times when I think you're going to be really able to absorb that information. And not just that, but because you're primed through your daily practice to be able to apply those things, 
it's going to be really easy for you to match the abstract study to what you're actually doing because you're doing it day in, day out. So the things that you notice need work the most in your day-to-day -day work and your practice and you're just drawing fun stuff that you like are the things where you can go and find the solution or the answer to. And the internet and the modern educational systems where we have access to that kind of thing, so many books, so many courses, so many YouTube videos, so many you know bits of information that are there to help us, that it's very easy to find the information you need. And I think that is a very chaotic way of working and learning, but it is you know a very effective way. It's also totally worthwhile to do intensive study of the foundation and do a whole thing on rendering and, and perspective and you know, really dig into it. I, I think for me, it's one of the things that's helped me the most. And those things are challenging and they are tough and they are sort of antithetical to the artistic, creative mindset and being, but they do help. And when you integrate them, they really help. The key is to not let the tail wag the dog. Don't let that be something that you become too proud of or focus on too much. And understand that the integration of that information into your style and your process can be something that takes some time. And that is something you actually have to work on. That is the thing that is the actual skill. So it's not just a matter of understanding the abstract exercise. It's a matter of applying it and integrating it. So what I suggest, as I said in the beginning of this, is, is actually very simple. Is just draw the work that you actually want to do and then notice where you're really lacking some foundational concept that could be better, be it perspective, rendering, anatomy, color theory, etc., etc., and use that as the impetus to go in and maybe suck up some of that theoretical knowledge with the knowledge that you can then go and apply it and see which bits of it relate to what you're doing and how you are actually going to implement that information into your work. And I think that is a very simple pathway, but I think hopefully I've made the case that it is probably, you know, one of the most effective ones. The answer to this question of fun versus fundamentals is, I think, pretty simple. The fun comes first and the fundamentals come second. The reason for this is if you're not enjoying the process, if you're not enjoying drawing, then you're not going to get into flow. You're not going to be able to do it well anyway. And it's just not really going to be possible to actually apply those fundamentals in the first place. The second thing is that we're actually quite good at just learning by doing anyway. So you find a lot of people who just really love drawing. And I often see this. This is one of the counterintuitive things that happens as someone who spends a lot of time educating people about drawing is that you will get those like 17 year old to 19 year old kids who just like sort of don't really listen or care about the fundamentals, but they'll be in class, but they just love drawing manga or whatever. And they just keep doing it and doing it and doing it, and doing it. And they kind of get better. And they take a few things that you're saying in and some of the things they ignore and you kind of say like, look, you really should work on this because it'll help this. And they're kind of just like, hey, I don't care. They just like doing it. And what I find is very often they just get better, you know, and you come back a few years later and they've kind of figured some of these things out. They've kind of applied it and they're very good at the application. And it's to a degree where, you know, other people will say, oh, but they don't understand perspective. And yet everyone likes their work better because they figured out some things about the actual game, about the actual work of making someone interested in what you're creating, of communicating your emotion and your message. They're actually quite good at that. And that's really what matters. And as I've said before, I've seen students who focus on the fundamentals and smash it and get good at it. This is not someone who's being silly or irresponsible. They're using a lot of dedication and grit and determination, but yeah, it doesn't necessarily get them where they wanted to go. And it takes a big, you know, they have often have years where they have to reconnect with what they wanted to do and who they are as an artist. And thirdly, there's just the simple idea that if you're going to learn these fundamentals, as I said, you have to apply them. You have to actually integrate them. So it's not just that, you know, you can grind through these fundamentals and not have any fun and expect to get good because if you're just working on them anyway and you're kind of having this maybe sort of negative, like grindy attitude toward just getting your basics and your foundation done, 
what you'll find is, again, you're not practicing the things that are important. It's going to be challenging to figure out how to get that sort of habit that you've built and move it into, okay, how do I create cool pictures that I'm actually excited about that are linked to the things that maybe want to draw in the first place? So again, pretty simple. The fun has to come first. The fundamentals will help, but only if they're integrated. I don't think you can actually smash it that hard anyway, because there's only a certain amount, there's only a certain amount of information you can accumulate per day anyway. It's only a small amount of new information you can actually you know, work in. And I think what we should do is spend a majority of our time just practicing and doing the things that we want to do, drawing the things that are fun, that you enjoy, and spend a smaller amount of time on these foundational principles. Because even though they're critical and they'll help, they're best done in moderation and they're best done when you have a chance to integrate them. All right. So as a takeaway, as some simple ways that we can compress this advice into, you know, something that you can actually use. Let's look at this from an analytical point of view, a, a simple colloquial common uh, advice bro sense, also from a kind of, you know, practical, what should you do? Like what steps can you actually take right now? And also from a spiritual point of view, how do these things relate to those deeper questions that we often face as artists? All right. So if we look at this from the analytical point of view, I feel like I've probably covered this because this entire talk has been fairly analytical in the first place. But I think what we can really take away from this is the science of flow, the level of brain waves that we are often in when we are in flow and the way that stress is going to interrupt that. So I think it's clear to me from the data or the quote unquote science that we need to be relaxed to be doing good drawing. Now, this doesn't mean that you need to be sort of, you know, like, oh, meditative, relaxed, we're calm. It's whatever you perceive as being calm. So, you know, often what I say is if that means you're just sitting there, you know, like really intense listening to death metal, um, that might be the thing that you need to kind of calm and focus, right? Whatever it is for you that allows you to get into flow. The opposite of that is just stress, right? Being anxious, being stressed, being worried about these things and not necessarily going to help us go into flow. It's kind of the opposite mindset. It's very useful, but not for us in this case. The second analytical point is that we need to integrate the skills. Now, this is something that, again, I don't have a lot of you know scientific evidence for, but it's very clear to me just looking at sports science and how people talk about this, that if at all possible, you should try and practice the thing that is as close to what you are going to do. Now, luckily for us as artists, we're not trying to, you know, achieve a skill where we're playing for some crazy sports playoff, right? Where this is the grand finale of the year and you've only got one shot. It's really hard to prepare for that because you, you need to be literally playing against another team that wants to beat you. We're not, you know, doing martial arts where, again, you're trying to kill each other in a ring. So that's good. We don't need to kind of step back our practice so that, you know, we avoid getting brain damage or something like that. It's very easy for us as artists to practice doing the thing that we're doing. Our goal is not necessarily to do a performance where it's all or nothing. You've got to get it all perfect, right? You're stepping out on stage and every movement has got to be exactly right. And that's what you're practicing for, but you can't really simulate it. The thing that we do as artists is we sit in our studio, in our room, in our cafe, wherever we are, and we do our thing. And the way that we would create our masterwork, the best thing that we've ever created, is going to be done in a very similar way to the way that you would probably, you know, do your least, you know, amazing piece of work. We're blessed in that sense. You know, we, we're often doing exactly the same thing. And so the more you can get them to be similar, the better. And I think we're very lucky as artists that it's easy for us to do that. Lastly, on the analytical front, again, just appreciate what I think is a really important observation about the learning modality and how we may have been taught in the past and how trauma and worry and fear of failure and our relationship to what we do when we do fail, right? Step back, get more information, make sure we don't get it wrong a second time because that's really embarrassing. The physical skill acquisition learning modality the visual learning modality is nonverbal. It's where we're just looking at how other people are doing it. 
we're observing things, we're taking in this visual information, we're practicing again and again and again. It's not about failure. It's just about perfecting. Little bit by bit, we get better and better and there's no end point where we win. You just keep getting better until finally you die, right? Um, and that's it, you know, and that's as good as you can get. Everything up until then is not about failure. It's just about improvement, continual self-improvement. And that, again, is one of the best things about doing this is you've always got something to work on. You can do it into your old age. And again, that's something that we should appreciate and view as special and important and unique about learning art. If we want the bro version of this, it's that learning art is much more like playing basketball and learning to get a ball through a hoop to win a point than it is about writing an essay or getting a math question right. You just have to focus on doing it and practicing and practicing and trying to get better and better and better. And you're going to be better off thinking about muscle memory and having the right attitude. Focus on the ball. Don't stress out. Don't get in your head, brah. And uh, in most cases, it'll kind of work out. If you want to frame this from what do you actually do? What do you actually do right now? I think, again, my my general set of advice for this is, is, is very specific to me and what I've seen work for other people. But again, you have to find your own way through this. But I would say, as a general rule, spend most of your time drawing cool stuff that you're really excited about. Focus on the things that you want to draw, why you became an artist in the first place. Um, link that to, again, you know, what do you want to do as a job? What is your goal? What are you trying to achieve? What's fun about that? Focus on the fun. Focus on enjoying it. Look, the results might suck. You might not be happy with it, but at least you're kind of practicing the thing that you want to do and finding enjoyment through the process of that, you know, getting into flow, doing your artistic thing, I think is way more important than, you know, worrying about all the other stuff. The foundation and the abstract exercises are vital though. If you do want to, you know, push your craft, I think you can get to a really high level without studying foundational stuff. And I've seen people do that. Everyone has their own relationship to things like rendering perspective, anatomy, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone uses it and implements it differently. Some people know a lot more of it than others, but everyone I feel like who gets to a certain level has a, you know, a decent appreciation for the basics of all of these things. And the abstract exercises, like again, rendering cubes, drawing cubes in perspective, casting shadows, studying anatomy, doing life drawing, maybe doing master studies, doing color studies. All of these things, even though they're not us actually doing our work, can help us improve as long as we integrate them. So what I would say is, again, going back to previous episodes, I really think you probably only have one or two hours of serious, like I'm soaking up new information that I've never learned before and I'm going to be able to focus on it. So a good formula, if you want a formula, is that you should probably spend half an hour to, you know, two hours max working on any sort of abstract study or, you know, sort of technical artistic stuff. And you should spend the rest just drawing things you like. Um, you know, obviously, if you have less than a whole day to work on your art, then again, you know, it might be a matter of spending, you know, half an hour, an hour on, you know, some really technical stuff. But again, spend the majority of your time working on the art you want and really figuring out what that is and enjoying the process. From the spiritual point of view, to me, this is really a matter of connecting with and appreciating our lineage as non-verbal, non-written learning things, right? We started off as, you know, single cell amoeba walking around, we acquired skills, and the primary way that we've been built to acquire skill is just by doing. And we're much better at that. I think we're almost so good at, at that and so bad at understanding things through verbal and, and written methodologies. Those things are so abstract. It's so easy to get them confused to understand like, oh, is that the word you mean that I'm thinking? When you see someone do something and then you do it and you get the same result, it's really simple. It's so easy. And we have such a history and an ability. You have a genetic predisposition to learning this way. You're built with it. You come with a million years of non-verbal, you know, visual muscle memory, um, all of this stuff. You, you come with a huge history of skill acquisition that almost kind of does this stuff by itself. It happens automatically, right? You just see someone doing something and then you can do it. 
That's how the mirror neurons work, right? You see someone do an action that seems important and your body is actually firing the same neurons that you would imagine that they're firing as they do the thing. You're actually mirroring their action in your mind and it's happening automatically whether you want it to or not. That's such an important thing and it speaks to our existence as physical beings who have a history of being physical, of creating tools, of developing craft, learning how to build those tools, learning how to entertain each other, learning how to, again, you know, take our abstract ideas and make them real. And that, you know, we don't necessarily need a lot of this fancy stuff. If it's really valuable, you know, take it, but don't let it run the show. Don't let the tail wag the dog when it comes to the way that you learn. I think that appreciating these ancient skills that we have is really, really important. And if you can combine the latest sort of technology and understanding that we have for skill acquisition, and you can combine it with, again, a million years of evolution, I think you have a really potent combination. And if you get that combination right, I think you not only get better faster, you get better overall. And you do so in a way that appreciates and understands the natural emotions and hormones and all of the stuff that goes on in your body. And I think that that's, again, it's one of these ways where we can exist as artists in a much more natural state. And to me, that's one of the things that I enjoy the most about doing this is that when I'm creating, I'm, you know, back like that monkey was, you know, cracking that nut with a rock, right? It's very primal. It's very um, relaxing, right? And all of this modern distraction nonsense kind of drifts away because the neocortex just sort of disappears and we return to a much simpler way of life. As a last thought, it's worth mentioning that if we have fun when we're creating, or if we feel emotion, if we feel like we're wanting to do the thing that we're doing, it's something that people can feel in our work. And I think going forward, this is going to be more and more important as, you know, there are other ways to get art to look very technically perfect is that the thing that will separate you as an artist is in many ways, your enjoyment of the process, your ability to communicate that to people to share that with people, to share this feeling again of being connected to this sort of older way of creating things that is less technical and less sort of about creating this refined version of reality, something that is a little bit more personal and about you. I think that ultimately this is what people want out of art. They want to feel the fun of drawing. They want to be reminded of them drawing as children. And I think that's why, again, Picasso and these artists that maybe didn't always exemplify the technical characteristics of, you know, the artist that came before was nevertheless able to captivate people because there's that sort of sense of fun and playfulness that pervades the work. And I think this is, you know, very much similar to the way people, you know, perceive all types of work right now. So, Having fun is not just good for your improvement. I think it's ultimately something you want to cultivate as your artistic process because it's something that ultimately is a big part of the end goal. It's something people can feel in your work. And I think ultimately that's what is going to matter. All right. Anyway, that's all I've got for this one. Um, let me know if you've got any thoughts or have you got any experiences about learning fundamentals, learning new skills, whether you found some of these ideas helped you or you've got some other things to add. I'd be really keen to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Um, because again, this is something where, you know, I think we're all going to be a little bit different. And I think we can help each other through this journey together by, again, sharing these stories and, and helping each other understand how, you know, your particular attitude towards life relates to these ideas of, you know, enjoyment and fundamentals. Also, I just want to say that I really appreciate everyone who has subscribed and liked the videos on YouTube or is checking this out in podcast form so far. Um, I feel like we've gotten off to a really good start. This is just episode three, but I feel like, uh, again, feedback has been really positive and I'm super, super happy with that. So again, if you can continue to subscribe, like, um, again, give a review on Apple podcasts or other 
other platforms. I'm going to get this up on Spotify um, soon. Those things do tend to help, um, you know, sort of um, boost the numbers on these things and allow more people to kind of see it. So that is something that I really, really appreciate if you have the time to do that. But apart from that, we'll catch you around and I'll see you in the next one.